Hey, what's up everyone? Alex here. So today is going to be a very special video. Um, so it's a world or tell type of video, but at the same time, I'm covering one of the events that I first held uh, in Singapore. So I think um, over the years, uh, besides, you know, uh, organizing local community events and tournaments, uh, I've also uh, had the chance once to kind of hold a World Othello uh, international event in Singapore. So back then it was in 2014. I think it was a very special event. It's more like a sequel or a continuation of the Othello World Cup 2013, which was kind of a special project back then to kind of do an invitational event. So what happened in 2013 was that they were celebrating 40th anniversary of the Othello trademark itself. And at the same time, uh, it was a very special event whereby they decided to invite a uh, 40 of uh, hand-picked uh, top players around the world and provided a special sponsorship of USD 1000 to each player just to kind of attend the event. So that was a very special kind of subsidy, at least, you know, um, our flights and, you know, some food got, got covered in terms of the cost. So it would be a lot less uh, of a obstacle to kind of attend such an event. And that was in, in Japan, Tokyo. Uh, and that was in conjunction with pretty much when Tokyo Skytree was uh, quite new and was open. So um, the continuation of that was uh, Othello World Cup 2014 over here, Marina Bay Sands. Uh, we did he held it over there. So I wanted to do like a quick event review and also share with you the fun aspect of Othello's Speedwave uh, event during that uh, particular World Cup. So yeah, without further ado, let's uh, quickly just go over the schedule. We'll cover uh, some games within Live Othello, and then uh, I'll just show you the sights and sounds of uh, Othello Speedwave in general. So this was basically the drafted schedule for the event. So um, timeline uh, as part of this that was prepared by myself uh, was basically following a s uh, standard kind of WOC similar to WOC uh, format, except that uh, the top eight actually advanced to the third day for a semifinals. So I think uh, something that was interesting is that uh, I organized a little bit of play session uh, for people to kind of uh, play different events over here. So we had the special event of Grand Otello, Eight Stars Otello, and even a team competition that was planned out. And then uh, the welcome reception with the first round pairings, which is pretty much traditional across for the Otello World Cup. So I think something that was different was that we had to cut our budget a little bit due to the special event uh, being pretty expensive at the Marina Bay Sands, Singapore. But at the same time, uh, you know, it was a very nice experience. So in the initial plan was 13 rounds and that kind of got cut to 11 rounds uh, but we still did have uh, the quarterfinals for the top eight players and then we have the eight stars hotel tournament and the green hotel tournament together with the victory dinner at the end of the event with the prize giving ceremony so this was like kind of the overall uh, timeline and the schedule of the event so let's uh, cut over to live hotel now and just take a look at some games perhaps So I think before we kind of go into the live Otello games, uh, I just wanted to share a quick uh, word on, you know, the event that was held at MBS hot, uh, Hotel Ballroom, so in the Orchid function room. So uh, aptly, very aptly, Orchid is actually the national flower of Singapore. So I think it was very special to kind of have it within the Orchid uh, series function rooms. And this poster was kind of co-designed with me and uh, my secretary back then, which is uh, none other than Yen Shao. So yeah, definitely he did a great job in executing the poster. We kind of conceptualized the, the design. So the three kind of pillars were meant to kind of emulate uh, Marina Bay Sands uh, building, the iconic three towers together with the sky park on top that's kind of blended in with the background. So we kind of put in the Speedwave uh, logo as well with this colorful, just color coded the, the Speedwave and then gave like a kind of green, greenish black hue on the back just showing Othello World Cup 2014 event in Singapore and we do have a few partner sponsors back then so including the organization itself Lee Foundation uh, the Japan Othello Association Mega House of course being the company that manufactures Othello uh, Singapore Flyer did give us some free tickets for some of the guests uh, who came from overseas the World Othello Federation and of course Marina Bay Sands Singapore who very kindly gave us a, a very preferential rates for the rooms so that it can accommodate our <laughs> relatively low budget for the event. And you can see the overall kind of uh, look and feel of the event was really, really nice. Uh, you can see you know, some Singapore players, some Japanese players, and definitely some European players. So we did invite uh, some of the very iconic top players to join the event. 
And um, yeah, basically it was a relatively small pool, but at the same time it was a very fun event. So you can see Makoto, Tsukuni Makoto, who was uh, the Japanese two-time world champion who actually was based in Singapore for about um, four to five years. He was greatly influencing um, and of course shaping Singapore up and kind of helping as a mentor as well. And yeah, you can see um, the Italian Francesco Marconi, uh, unfortunately our brother here from Italy, um, has actually recently passed away. But um, yeah, it was very nice to kind of see him. And obviously, he's done very well in the past tournaments. And he's one of the strongest, um, you know, European players that we've known. Um, so yeah, it's nice to kind of see a familiar face just looking back. And then, of course, quite a few ladies who joined this event. Um, obviously, Joanna William being the female uh, world champion. Um, so she won OWC 2013, and she also won uh, the Meijin Sen. I think that's the first time a foreigner uh, has actually won a Meijin title, at least for the female title. So a pretty special event. And of course, you have players from China who actually took the double crown in the end. Uh, Dong Zhen, uh, who took the female uh, crown, and also with Song Yan, who took the open category crown. So I think it was a very special, cozy event. Um, yeah, so let's move on uh, quickly to the games. So here we are at the Live Othello website, and obviously um, Live Othello is uh, the open website for all of the national organizations and federations to kind of come in and, uh, you know, key in the games you know on a live basis and at the same time it functions as a very nice archive so if you were to kind of scroll down over the years you'll be able to pick up the years and of course i did pick up othello world cup 2014 that was the first event of the year that we um i think that the website uh, received uh you know some games and that was within january as well so understandably so uh, i just wanted to pick up a quick game between junfeng and yamakawa so junfeng obviously being one of the big three uh, players in Singapore uh, and he's won you know just the Singapore Open uh, in 2012 and also done very well within those few years in terms of the national tournaments and obviously um, he's coming in to kind of play against a uh, seven dan uh, Japanese player Yamakawa who was actually a former world uh, third place uh, so yeah second runner-up basically so if we just quickly click through the games of uh, you know Junfeng and Yamakawa as kind of like a just wanted to look through like one of the first two rounds uh, you know this is round two obviously so um, let's just take a look at the game so Junfeng played like kind of a scorpion obviously when you run into like a Stephenson line of openings against Japanese it's always difficult to play so he played the minus four variation which is his uh, kind of iconic opening so he does know this opening pretty well so I think he was feeling confident against the Japanese even though it's a Stephenson uh, variation so yeah I think obviously no surprises here with the exchange of the quiet moves and black advancing here I think it's a very defensive opening and, and quite a good opening selection by Junfeng to kind of play against a Japanese player so I think this execution here um, no major issues uh, so Yamakawa is kind of known to play an extreme uh, brand of Othello he plays really really well especially when he creates uh, these solid edges and solid shapes he knows his game very well so i think this was the game plan uh, that he has all along and playing at an extreme level so of course junfeng over here interestingly he didn't just go in for the b8 but rather kind of pull back one move and prevent that excess first um and white cutting into the x square trying to obtain e5 chasing back the excess down to b8 so again junfeng decided to kind of go one step to kind of prevent it again um possibly trying to force some errors so after um a couple of exchange uh, after White's f3 establishing f4 there's no way for black to kind of uh, defend it so sometimes this tactic is quite good uh, you delay going into an obvious square by preventing that access to it uh, make your opponent play a few more moves maybe your opponent plays an extremely loud move just to look for the excess that he needs to kind of jump in and regroup um, so if he does make some errors over here um, you'll be able to find some opportunities to kind of play along it so I think obviously Yamakawa is a very uh, skilled opponent so obviously he didn't make uh, major errors so i think this um c2 might look a bit questionable i mean to some extent um c2 is good but at the same time uh, by allowing white to play b2 uh white has essentially kind of defended the b column and black doesn't have like that chance to kind of get that number of this but i could be wrong yeah it could be fairly close um so i think 
obviously here black would be more like a force situation where he had to jump in and it looks like white's kind of defended parity pretty well um yeah basically shut down parity over here so yeah i think not much chance to kind of overturn after here if i'm not wrong so maybe if we take a look at the ai let's see this position again so black was actually winning interesting um over here black was probably having a win line and yeah basically i think this move probably not too great um maybe should have gone into the corner and then swept down perhaps uh oh sorry that was the wrong sequence actually so obviously um oh okay this is interesting so what happens if we put this over here uh blue white goes in here ah okay black white and then probably the intersection is possible or is it uh so basically giving it up for white to kind of connect these two rows um followed by the setup move yeah so in fact the b column is extremely important over here it is quite difficult to kind of come up with this but at the same time if you think about it black white and followed by black white um, this kind of becomes like a hyper even number theory uh, probably allows you to win the game yeah by reversing parity so that's quite interesting i think this functions as a very good uh, end game puzzle uh, in fact so if those of you at home you're interested in kind of looking at such a puzzle in terms of more of like um you need to play out a move commit and make your opponent commit to a shape whereby it changes things in the interior and opens up opportunities to kind of sweep the rows so i think it's quite important a concept uh, of an end game concept so pretty wasted for Jun Fong. um obviously oh uh, every time you play a top japanese player it's extremely difficult to kind of <laughs> gain an advantage and but this opening is quite a nice uh, opening that he kind of carved out an advantage and a win line against uh, Yamakawa. So yeah, kudos to Junfeng. So I think that's round two, and I wanted to just quickly briefly touch on the final game between Song Yen and uh, Kenta Tominaga. So Kenta Tominaga was a 2007 world champion, I believe. And uh, obviously he's very, very strong. Uh, I think he seldom plays a lot of domestic local Japanese tournaments as much as most of the other younger generation does. But every time he appears, he's he's playing very strong. So I think that's evident in his final showing. So interestingly, Song Yen played No Kong and then uh, Tommy Naga played this D3 variation. Uh, cuts into the center. Uh, so I think this one is interesting because it's almost like a partial checkerboard whereby you're controlling this mini diagonal, this horizontal and also this vertical. So I think this opening is an uh, interesting choice to play and white cuts out to try to obtain access uh, perhaps to D2 uh, and black prevents it from happening. White cuts out again, black just goes with the flow, uh, white goes in for the poison. So I think um, very skilled exchange between both players, uh, just trying to shape out uh, the opening and progress through the mid game. Yeah, so I think this crossback is extremely strong from Tominaga. Uh, this crossback basically earns him tempo. At the same time, it controls this mini diagonal between B4 and E7. I would say it's a very special move. When I saw it live, um, I was quite impressed by this uh, change, change up over here. And at the same time, this kind of becomes a spare move for black and black is just waiting for white to kind of break up. I'm too sure, yeah, white basically take, took advantage to try to gain tempo back on the right. So this is a lost tempo and trying to gain back the tempo over here. So regroup multiple moves, regroup over here. White is kind of forced in some way. I'm not too sure if G7 is the best just looking at this, um, whether black has any other options like maybe E1 or, but yeah, black plays this, white jumps out, uh, carve out a shape, uh, black goes for this. Um, Questionable, but I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, let's see. So over here, uh, oh, okay, so it's a draw line. Uh, I'm not too sure what's the rating before that because the AI is not showing, but I do find this move a bit questionable by black. I'm not too sure about that, but it opens up an opportunity for parity uh, gain for white over here. So I think obviously white won it by a small margin. So uh, basically a hold on, a firm hold on the parity basically won the game for white. So I think a very interesting game. Um, probably worth reviewing it at least for the opening stage um yeah so i think this was an extremely nice game between both uh, top players and obviously song yen won three japanese through quarterfinals um semifinals and finals um so yeah kudos to him and definitely his his main world title over here he's had have had quite a few world or tele championships uh semifinals showing uh thereafter so 
haven't quite gotten the luck to win a world uh, Othello Championship yet, but he did win this Othello World Cup event, so I think it's uh, quite good. So, yeah, let's probably take a quick look at the, the pictures, perhaps, uh, of the, the game situation and the finals, yeah. So yeah, basically um, after covering the game, we wanted to take a quick look at the picture. So this was kind of like the pre-final uh, picture uh, that they took before they played their final best of one game. And of course, not forgetting our crew behind uh, Simin and also Clara. Uh, both of them, uh, one of my first uh, few batches of students within uh, the secondary school or basically junior high school equivalent in Singapore. And obviously, both of them uh, were very nice to kind of volunteer their help within the event to kind of support it as a crew. And they were taking care of like uh, the webcam and also live Otello streaming. So the game earlier that you saw was probably recorded by them. Uh, so obviously, we know that Song Yan has already won that final. And over here, um, you know, he's more than happy to kind of win a champion uh, championship over here. So I think... Um, Song Yan has kind of come quite a long way. I know he's been joining WOC since uh, as early as 2006, and obviously back then he was at 8 wins level. So to come from 2006 to 2014 to becoming a world champion, um, a span of 8 years, I think uh, definitely explains and also justifies his dedication. So I think it's really great for him. And yeah, he's also a great personal friend to me. And <laughs> he's you know commented that Singapore is his kind of like lucky place to some extent, you know, winning... Um, the world, uh, the Hotel World Cup over here, and uh, subsequently he did come to Singapore for to join the Singapore National Championship, and also won a title in 2017. So yeah, a very special event for him, I guess, and a special place. I think Singapore is a very nice place to for people to visit in general. Um, so yeah, definitely welcome, you know, and hope to see any of you guys, you know, who come to my channel uh, ultimately at the World Title Championship. Hopefully one day Singapore would organize another one, um, you know, this time being a World Hotel Championship. And yeah, I get to see all of you guys in Singapore. So yeah, so I think besides the main event, the main Hotel event, there was also side events like um, uh, interesting initiatives like Eight Stars Hotel, where the board is basically um, like an 88 square board. Um, you can imagine a 10 by 10 board and cutting away the corners and the C squares and that gives you the board. Um, and there's also the Grand Otello, which is essentially the 10 by 10 Otello. And obviously the Otello speed wave that I wanted to share with you, uh, extremely fast paced uh, disc flipping. So it's more about a race against time to kind of complete 64 disc flips on the board, uh, flipping all the, bo all the discs on the board from one color to another. So that's uh, quite an interesting thing to do when you pitch yourself against an opponent one on one and you start off at the same time. So yeah, let's go into a few quick video clips. Uh, yeah, so we'll start off with like the quarterfinals between um, Takeshi Murakami and Hiroshi Goto, followed by semifinals. Um, uh, I think basically, uh, sorry, there's another quarterfinals by Yuji Miyazaki versus Chin Fui San, and uh, obviously the semifinals between Makoto and Chin Fui San. Uh, and Makoto being the eventual champion, uh, eventually played the finals against Yamakawa and both of them flipped extremely fast. So I hope you enjoy the video clips and thank you very much for joining me and I'll see you at the next video. Enjoy the last few clips. Go. Oh, my God. 